Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. In its first two years in office, the Biden administration in Washington was seemingly reluctant to threaten Iran with military action should diplomatic efforts to stop its progress to where nuclear weapons fail. Lately, however, out of obvious frustration at Tehran's refusal to revive the 2015 nuclear agreement or the so-called JCPOA, American officials have gone back to using the phrase, everything is on the table. Joint military exercises with Israel, such as the unprecedented Juniper Oak and tabletop simulations of operations, are supposed to bring home to the Ayatollah regime in Tehran the effectiveness of a massive strike, should one be decided on, in either Washington or Jerusalem or both. How credible are such threats, and are the blunt American and Israeli messages getting through to the Iranian decision-makers to help us ponder these questions? We're joined from central Israel by Dr. Meir Javed Anfar, who is an Iran lecturer at Reichman University in Herzliya. Thank you for joining us, sir. Thank you. Also joining us from northern Israel is Brigadier General in Reserve, Relik Shafir, who is a former Air Force uh, commander, the commander of the Tel- uh, North Air Base. Thank you for joining us, General. And with me here in the studio is our editor-at-large, uh, Mr. Amir Oren, who is the host, of course, of Watchmen Talk, Powers in Play, and so much more. Uh, Amir, how about you give us a broader understanding of this CMT, credible military threat? Is it getting through to the other side? So it's uh, very difficult uh, to uh, calculate inputs versus outputs. Obviously, the Israeli Air Force and other branches of uh, the Israeli defense and intelligence uh, establishment uh, has a lot of uh, capabilities. You mentioned the Tel Nof uh, Air Base, which General Shafir once commanded. In an earlier period, out of this base, um, a target in Tunis uh, was uh, uh, struck by uh, F-15 uh, fighters uh, from, from Tel Nof. And this was uh, the longest uh, flight. It's uh, almost uh, twice the distance to um, uh, targets in Iran. Uh, should Israel uh, decide to do it and should uh, uh, planes f- uh, fly in a straight line, which, which they wouldn't. So uh, what Israel and the United States uh, have recently been doing Um, is uh, try and, uh, first of all, perfect the coordination between the various branches, especially now that CENTCOM, the U.S. Central Command, is in charge of uh, the Israeli area of operations, uh, too. And uh, it's very interesting to note that the um, uh, exercise, Juniper Oak, was conducted by CENTCOM, but from a UCOM, European Command, area two in the Eastern Mediterranean in order to to test uh, weapons and munitions, uh, American warships, uh, including an aircraft carrier, uh, operated uh, off the coast of of Israel in the Mediterranean. But this is only the input. The output depends, first of all, on the kinetic ability to destroy. And because we talk about deterrence, it has to do with perceptions. And uh, obviously, a mayor uh, would be able to tell us how all of these operations and signals are being received and perceived in Tehran. Before we uh, ask that of mayor, I'd like to bring General Shafir into the discussion, uh, who has plenty of experience in this uh, area, of course, uh, being part of the wing that struck the Osirak in uh, uh, 1981, uh, 7th of June, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and... I'd like to ask you, General, when we're looking at um, signals from either uh, political echelons or uh, militaries, uh, one of the things that is always being taught, at least in military academies, is listen and hear what is said, what is not said, but ultimately look at what is done on the ground. What are the uh, equipments that are being uh, procured in order to execute what is being said, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, when we look at Jerusalem, obviously the message between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, of course, the the headquarters of the defense ministry, uh, is quite cohesive about its intentions. There are clear red lines. If these are crossed, uh, Israel will have to act, and 
hopefully will do so with American approval and backing. When we look at Washington, however, we hear different messages coming out of the Pentagon and the State Department at this stage. From a diplomatic perspective in the State Department, it's being said that Juniper Oak, the joint military exercise, which was truly unprecedented in scale, uh, is supposed to reassure uh, U.S. partners in the region, including Israel, about uh, Washington's ironclad support for the state of Israel, as well as to Israel's Arab moderate uh, neighbors and, and uh, the, the ones who are aligned with the United States in, in regional endeavors. Uh, and at the same time, in the Pentagon, we uh, hear a lot more specific um, upscale or uh, a robust uh, emphasis on the scale of this military exercise, what type of tools were used, how uh, capable these tools are, and what effect this uh, should bring to the other side. Does this mean that at the moment the diplomacy fails, the, the plan B so-called, which nobody obviously is going to speak about, the contingency plans are going to be as robust as the Pentagon emphasizes? It's quite obvious that the United States has not made a decision um, to uh, uh, go through a military strike. And this is uh, true that they said it's on the table, but the, the question is how credible it is and how do the Iranians perceive the credibility of such a plan? Uh, obviously, our side, the Israeli side, would like to convey to the Iranians that it's not only uh, possible, but it may be imminent if they cross a red line. Uh, now, the red line, it's not clear where the red line is drawn at this time, but uh, our side would like the uh, U.S. to uh, be more assertive, uh, more combative, and the United States is trying, at least the State Department, and it's always been that way, is trying to uh, hold both the diplomatic weapon and the military weapon uh, as compatible and exchangeable. So um, I think it's obvious who wants to do what. The question whether Israel can strike alone, uh, it's not just a, a yes and no question. It's also uh, whether Israel can agitate the Iranians to uh, dis to be destabilized to such a, a, a degree that it would force the Western forces, not just the United States, but also the Europeans, into being more active. And I think the answer to this question has been answered about a week ago uh, with the attack on the uh, uh, facilities in Iran. So uh, the question remains, in in uh, in a sense, in um, uh, tension between the Israeli wishes and the American uh, strategy at this time. Indeed, Mr. Tavenan Fal, I'd like to bring you into the conversation. How, the Ayatollah regime obviously takes Israel seriously. It, it uh, uh, changed its uh, strategic perspective towards the Israeli military as its number one adversary in the region, and has been actively engaged in preparing for a regional scale war with Israel. Initially, it seems like a deterrent, but obviously it can also execute uh, the orders by uh, bringing all of its proxies into the picture and trying to uh, destabilize uh, the region to the point where the Americans would have to step in and, and try and, and reassess uh, the course of action. Uh, how, to what degree is the, this threat, however, of an imminent strike truly credible to be honest with you um on the one hand we could say looking at the newspaper reports uh, published abroad uh, regarding um attacks attributed to israel and uh, looking at uh, the number of attacks attributed to the united states against iran um, and 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 the iranian responses to them we could say that Israel has created a much more, far more de de effective deterrence posture against the Islamic Republic of Iran than the United States. This is despite the fact that the United States is a superpower, the Islamic Republic is far more deterred 
uh, by Israel than than the United States when it comes to regional activities and uh, attacks associated with Israel, especially in uh, in Syria, in the international press, press and elsewhere. At the same time, despite the fact that Iran, the Islamic Republic of Iran, is more deterred by Israel, that has not translated into major, um, let's just say, preventative, preventative actions or, or major stoppages in Iran's nuclear program because of concern regarding a possible Israeli attack. I don't see the Iranians uh, stepping back the nuclear program at the moment because of such concern. They are continuing to enrich at 60% at levels which are far closer to 90%, which is required to make a nuclear bomb. According to the IAEA chief uh, Grossi, Iran has enough uh, to build four or five nuclear weapons. It has enough enriched uranium if, if and when it decides to do so. And what worries me also is that the Iranians, according to the latest IAEA report, they started making changes, undeclared changes, to to the configuration of the centrifuges at the Bordeaux facility. So when you look at these things, the Iranian regime does not seem to be concerned that Israel is going to attack tomorrow. They are being careful, but they are carefully moving forward. And this is something that shows that the that the regime wants to continue and doesn't believe that the Israeli um, new military attack is around the corner. Mr. Owen? Um, let me uh, uh, voice a skeptical view about the relationship uh, between threats and deterrence. Um, in 1981, when Relik Shafir and his uh, seven uh, brothers in arms uh, flew to, uh, to Baghdad, Silence preceded it. There was no threat. There were diplomatic channels with the US and earlier with France, which supplied the equipment uh, for the reactor. But uh, Menachem Begin or the um, heads of uh, the IDF and the IAF did not come out with announcements warning Saddam Hussein that he should uh, cease and desist. Um, otherwise, they will show up one Sunday and, and bomb it. The same goes for the 2007 strike against Deir Azur, against the North Korean nuclear reactor built in Syria. And there, the problem was even more difficult because the mission um, had two directives. One, destroy the reactor. The other one, do not cause a general war with Syria. This is similar to what is happening here vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Yes, one uh, may uh, imagine an Israeli uh, strike which destroys the Iranian uh, nuclear infrastructure, but that will not be the end of the conflict. There will be a response, not only against Israel, but also against targets in the Gulf, against American forces there. And Israel cannot um, credibly say that it will be able to protect its own population against Hezbollah and others and all of these targets. So one should consider whether Israel has threatened too much. It is probably or possibly time for silence now, saying, OK, we have said our peace. Everybody knows that we are serious when we say it, enough is enough. And also, if we strike, we will also strike the regime. We will not only strike military targets. We are not right now um, in a, a policy mode of regime change. But if we are being existentially threatened, we will go for the head and not only for the facilities. Uh, I'd like to uh, briefly interject on, on the matter that uh, Mr. Mayer noted, uh, Mr. Javed Anfal, sorry. Uh, when we're looking at the assets that are being moved around and uh, the, the consequences of uh, various statements that were made by Israel, at, at least according to intelligence officials who spoke, uh, I've spoken with and uh, also with people within the IAEA who are actively engaged on, on multiple matters related to the Iran file, uh, they all say the Iranians are being overly careful and have started to change uh, the, the manner in which and methodologies 
in which they're acting in order to contend with a potential strike. Now, uh, what I'd like to ask, and this is uh, to you, General Shafir, uh, to what degree, if we take, of course, Junipur Oak into the picture, where the the exercise illustrated not only a, a kinetic strike, but also uh, uh, multiple strikes in multiple locations, does this seem to allude to the fact that if Israel were to strike, or there would be a joint strike of the infrastructure, the nuclear infrastructure in Iran. Would this mean that this would not be specifically only uh, the the attack on the nuclear program, but would then also, in order to avoid such a scenario as Mr. Oren just uh, uh, illustrated of retaliatory strikes against U.S. forces and so on uh, in the region, would this include a wide-scale maneuver or wide-scale uh, attack on multiple targets throughout Iran and throughout the region, for that matter? Uh, I would think on the contrary. Um, there is a certain level that would force Iran into uh, almost a full-scale war, which means uh, activating Hezbollah against Israel. Uh, but there is a level that is below a, a certain threshold, which means that um, targets of opportunity, such as uh, ports in Iran, uh, infrastructure that is not directly uh, forcing Iran to retaliate, uh, nudging away, so to speak, and uh, getting the message through that it this time we're taking secondary targets, but we can um, um, escalate this. This would, is most probably what would happen, because otherwise, if we go full scale, and full scale means that the United States is uh, active, not just Israel, and that would mean uh, supremacy, air, air power supremacy over Iran for several weeks, and uh, uh, getting munition into the uh, hard targets that are dug into the hills, uh, continuous bombing so as to get through the concrete and, and the rocks that uh, protect the uh, uh, crux of the uh, Iranian program, that would take weeks. And that mean, means a full-scale war where uh, everything is on the table, including... Um, um, leadership uh, symbols uh, in Iran itself. So, would I it, uh, General Shafir, I'd, I'd like to interject in, on this matter particularly. Would it take weeks? Because when there were, uh, were discussions about the million man army of Saddam Hussein at the time, uh, the United States also had a framework of weeks of, of uh, fighting, and ultimately it took them three days to overwhelm that army and, and evaporate it, so to speak. But it was a six-week war in which the ground phase what, was what you referred to. Right, indeed. I think the Saddam Hussein, uh, we know he, he didn't have uh, a program that was well dug into uh, by, uh, through concrete. They, it took them three days to get through uh, to get air supremacy, and I think the uh, Iraqi war machine uh, was much different. But we have to remember that uh, Khomeini, in his letter to his commanders in 1988, wrote, Iran needs a weapon uh, of leverage. I think that was uh, what he uh, wrote, at least the translation in English. Uh, and that was a result of the war with Iraq at the time. And they've been developing this from 1988, which is uh, quite a while. And um, I think strategically, they uh, would maybe, if they felt that the, the danger is imminent, they would lay it off for a while because they're thinking uh, in decades rather than in months and years. So I'm not sure that uh, we would go into an all-out war, but we would uh, uh, sort of go through the edges and start putting pressure on the edges to an extent that is below the uh, threshold of a full-scale war. I'm not sure the letter that Khomeini sent uh, to his generals was public knowledge, but 
if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I'd, I'd like to ask you, Mr. Javed Anfal, where does the Iranian calculus come into the picture? What is the the red line? Will they react in a manner in which they claim to react uh, in the event of a first stage strike or second stage strike uh, in in the Islamic Republic? You know, we've been, Jonathan, uh, respectfully, we've been talking about the scenario of the possible Israeli attack against uh, Iran. Uh, at least when I started doing, entered this business in 2005, and it's been talked uh, so many times and discussed and analyzed so many times that, it, that number one, um, I have to agree that, you know, sometimes it's better not to threaten the Islamic Republic of Iran. I think silence would from Israel would be a bigger threat to them because then they would really worry about, well, my God, what's happening here? What are the Israelis planning to do? But whether the Israeli government is going to do that, um, I'm not sure, especially not with Prime Minister Netanyahu, who, who uh, uses the Iran card for domestic political purposes. At the same time, another factor, which is an, an important factor, which has changed since we started discussing the possibility of an Israeli military strike against Iran in the press, is that is the Russia factor. Iran, the Islamic Republic of Iran, is a crucial supplier of weapons to Russia now, so much so that the Russians are going to uh, start producing Iranian drones on their own soil and quite possibly improve and to improve them. Now, the question exists as to whether Russia would fight on the Iran's behalf in case of an Israeli strike. The Russia, Russian, Russia experts say that it's very unlikely. But at the same time, we have to take into consideration that should the status quo continue, Iran is going to have a protected supply of drones in Russian territory, perhaps improved drones, which could threaten us. And at the same time, it's the question of the Su-35, the Sukhoi-35, which is being discussed between Iran and Russia. Now, I don't know uh, how much of a game changer that's going to be. Nevertheless, that is going to boost Iran's confidence. So we also have to take in those factors into consideration when we talk about Iranian reply to a possible Israeli strike. Uh, in terms of uh, whether Hezbollah and, or, or the Houthis in Yemen are going to be uh, activated, I think it's very likely. Uh, Iran sees them as its first line of deterrence and its first line of defense. Regardless of the scale of the strike in case of a strike? Look, if you're going to bomb Iran's nuclear reactor, if I were advising Israeli military planners, then then I would say I would seriously take into consideration the use of Hezbollah, because that's one of the main reasons why the Iranian regime has been building uh, Hezbollah. Look, you could say, let me just argue against myself by saying that there were uh, there were operations attributed by to Israel to the Mossad against uh, Natanz, for example. Uh, but these were small operations. If you're going to go in with huge uh, aircraft, then I think that's, you know, aircraft strike, uh, I think then that's more likely because Iran did not respond to the Mossad operations that were published in the Iranian, in the international press, because those were small operations. But if you have a large scale aerial operation, then I think that could change the equation. Well, some of those operations were subsequently acknowledged, but uh, as also the chief of Mossad or director of the Mossad, David Barnea, noted, and also the previous uh, NSC of Israel, uh, Dr. Eyal Khulata, uh, Hezbollah and Iran are one and the same. Uh, uh, the Hassan Nasrallah is part of the Ayatollah regime. He's not a separate uh, uh, puppet, and he advises them in this theater vis-a-vis -vis Israel. Uh, we have roughly two and a half minutes, Mr. Oren. When we look at the big picture, is there a scenario in which diplomacy would ultimately succeed, considering the fact that also President uh, Trump, uh, excuse me, President Biden, regardless of whether it was a, a blurb or, or whatnot, he said the deal is dead. We're not going to declare it, but it's dead. Is there a scenario in which uh, diplomacy would also become dead with that deal? No, diplomacy um, is going to revive that deal or uh, a similar one, uh, because um, I'm not trying to compete with Mayer for understanding the Iranian psyche, but 
my reading of Iran is that it is ultimately a nation of merchants. They want to bargain. They would like to get their objectives by finding the best possible deal rather than uh, by fighting. And if they can convert their agreement to stay just below the threshold, if they can get the benefits of an agreement, they would prefer to. One additional point um, regarding the air forces of both countries. Israel has a very good air force, and at least it is 90% capable at any time. Not 100%, but 90%. For Iran, it's perhaps 30%. They cannot maintain the air force after the first... Uh, Can I interject? Piece. Yes, please. Um, the, uh, returning to the Iran nuclear deal is almost impossible for Ayatollah Khamenei because uh, uh, enrichment, uh, traces of enrichment have been found at three different sites in Iran, inclu including Torghozabad, and the IAEA, and more importantly, President Biden, are insisting that he answers why there were traces of enrichment. Which and they would never do. Indeed. That. Indeed. Uh, he cannot because if he does, were, uh, he would it was be illegal activities. He, he would be in breach of the NPT, and Correct. as you mentioned, also regarding the last report of the IAEA, all agreements sound impossible until the day they are achieved. Right, and when diplomats stop speaking, guns start uh, blazing, and uh, hopefully we'll uh, be able to resolve this matter, regardless, uh, in a manner that will not bring so much loss of life uh, uh, in the ultimate uh, uh, confrontation, but. This is all the time that we have for today. I'd like to thank Mr. Javed Anfal, General uh, Shafir, and Mr. Oren. And I'd like also to thank all of our viewers at home. And we'll see you again next time for yet another episode of TV7 Jerusalem Studio. Shalom.